Chapter 4.5 Understanding Abstract Power Those who tell the stories rule society. Plato, Reference 84 So far, the author has outlined eight of ten applications of abstract thinking, which behaviorally modern sapiens have evolved since the Upper Paleolithic Era. The reader has learned about how sapient neocortices help sapiens with pattern finding, exercising caution, symbolism, planning, strategizing, higher order communication using semantically and syntactically complex languages, storytelling, solving physically unverifiable mysteries, and developing abstract constructs and belief systems like morals, ethics, and theologies. The last two applications of abstract thought are so important to the topic of power projection tactics employed by humans in modern agrarian society that they each get their own dedicated section. 9. Creating abstract power. And 10. Encoding abstract power hierarchies. As a quick disclaimer for the reader, these sections represent an inflection point where the concepts become political sounding. This is due to the subject matter. A discussion about how abstract power is created, how abstract power hierarchies function, and how abstract power hierarchies become dysfunctional to the point of motivating people to fight and kill each other at large scales is fundamentally a discussion about politics. Additionally, discussions about why humans fight and kill each other is an emotionally charged topic. There are few things as personal or as emotionally charged than the motives behind why one person would feel inclined to take the life of another. Chapter 4.5.1 To avoid physical conflicts, sapiens use abstract thinking to play make-believe. Sapient brains are so effortlessly gifted at abstract thinking and people have such strong natural instincts not to injure each other, that people will attempt to use their imaginations to avoid having to physically confront each other to settle their disputes, manage their resources, and establish their dominance hierarchies. One of the most defining characteristics of behaviorally modern sapiens who lived after the invention of agriculture and the wide-scale domestication of animals is the adoption of common belief systems where some people are able to wield abstract or imaginary power and those people are allowed to settle disputes, manage resources, and determine the pecking order for the broader population. Modern domesticated sapiens could be described as being so adverse to physical confrontation that they prefer to dress up in costumes and play make-believe to settle their disputes, manage their resources, and establish their pecking order. Then, emboldened by their ideologies, they look down upon wild animals precisely because those animals don't, or more accurately, can't, use their imaginations to settle their disputes or establish their pecking order. As previously noted, wild animals appear to be physiologically incapable of this. They don't have the watts to think abstractly or use their imaginations because they didn't learn how to handle tinder, control fire, and cook their fuel food to fuel their brains like humans did. Without critically examining human metacognition, it's hard to develop a first principles understanding of how and why agrarian society has decided to adopt belief systems where fully grown adults put on wigs and gowns and live action role play, LARP, like they have real power. Almost everywhere one looks in modern agrarian society, sapiens are seen using symbols of power rather than physical power. They print the symbols of their abstract power on pieces of cloth and tie them on top of flagpoles. They wear symbols of their abstract power as lapel pins. Some still continue to dress up in wigs, gowns, and crowns. Practically all of them stand up in front of podiums etched with symbols of their imaginary power. Everywhere one looks, are ostensibly powerful people projecting symbols of power instead of real physical power, a.k.a. Watts. Why do behaviorally modern humans behave this way? In what some might consider to be a comedic display of irony, society's symbol of, symbols of abstract power frequently show images of wild predators like lions 
animals which became fierce precisely because they don't role play to settle their disputes and establish their peck and order. Tie in this observation back to the core concept presented in the previous chapter about power projection tactics in nature. One of the reasons why lions are so fierce is because they mastered real power projection to build their dominance hierarchies, in addition to doing the other fierce things which domesticated sapiens claim is ideologically beneath them, even though they still engage in physical power competitions on a near routine basis. If one were to take the perspective of a non-human outsider, such as an alien visit in Earth, the social behavior of modern, domesticated agrarian sapiens might seem bizarre compared to the behavior of other animals. Sapiens behave much differently than other sapiens in nature. They live under a mutually adopted, global-scale, consensual hallucination where very few people get to have extraordinary levels of imaginary power that most of the population doesn't get to have access to. And then the population chooses to allow these people with non-existent physical power to call the shots. Why would sapiens behave like this? The previously mentioned explanation is because it serves as an alternative way to settle disputes, establish control authority over resources, and achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of property in an energy efficient way that doesn't directly cause injury. Emphasis on the word directly. In other words, abstract power is a story that people are intrinsically motivated to believe in because they like the idea of not having to spend energy or hurt each other to settle intraspecies disputes or establish their pecking order over limited resources. Abstract power and their corresponding dominance hierarchies, what the author calls abstract power hierarchies, represent a belief system to which many people subscribe simply because they want to believe there are viable alternatives to physical conflict as the basis for settling intraspecies disputes and establishing intraspecies pecking order. It's a good story which motivates people to work together and cooperate at large scales. The idea that sapiens have somehow outsmarted natural selection and used their neocortices to find the viable substitute for physical confrontation to settle intraspecies disputes and establish intraspecies pecking order is an extremely attractive idea. And as we know from the concepts provided about storytelling, the more sapiens can get behind a common idea, the more they can sum their physical power together and literally move mountains. Unfortunately, abstract belief systems are fictional stories. Our beliefs about a better way to settle our intraspecies disputes and establish our intraspecies pecking order also clearly don't work as well as we wish they would work because sapiens still routinely engage in physical confrontation to settle intraspecies disputes and establish intraspecies pecking order the exact same way animals do. Chapter 4.5.2 Belief in imaginary power is an attack vector which breeds god kings. It is not the lash they fear. It is my divine power, but I am a generous God. I can make you rich beyond all measure. Circes 300, reference 85. There are major downsides to the wide scale adoption of common abstract belief systems, which are critical to investigate if we are to understand why sapiens struggle to find lasting alternatives to physical confrontation as the basis for solving intraspecies disputes and establishing intraspecies pecking order. A major problem which will be discussed at length in this chapter is that belief systems represent a breeding ground for systemic predators to psychologically abuse and systemically exploit entire populations of people through their belief systems. These attackers are passive aggressive and often go without detection because they don't have a physical footprint. It is therefore necessary to call them out explicitly so that we can better understand the complex, trans-scientific, and socio-technical implications of new technologies like Bitcoin. Storytelling introduces a psychological attack vector where sapiens can be preyed upon. The most common way this happens in agrarian society is by telling stories to convince people to adopt belief systems where a select few people have abstract power. The problem is abstract power is systemically exploitable. By convincing people to believe in abstract power, 
storytellers deliberately implant an exploitable vulnerability into people's imaginations, which they can take advantage of later. It's essentially a zero-day exploit for people who are familiar with common computer exploits. Once storytellers have convinced a population to adopt a belief system where imaginary power exists, storytellers create a vector through which they can exploit people by giving them access to imaginary power, endogenous to the belief system. This type of predatory behavior through people's belief systems emerged early in agrarian society and has persisted for thousands of years. A simple example of these kinds of predators who systemically exploit their population's belief systems were god kings, such as the pharaoh shown in figure 43. Here we have figure 43, a pharaoh, a god king, exploiting a population's belief system. To better understand how vulnerable sapient belief systems are to psychological exploitation and abuse, we can use adversarial thinking to analyze how to create and codify abstract power. The reader is invited to assume you are a systemic predator who wants to psychologically exploit a human population's belief system for your own personal advantage. What is the most important thing you need the population to believe in so that you can have extraordinary amounts of imaginary power and control authority over their valuable resources? One thing that you could do is convince them to believe that using physical power to establish their dominance hierarchy is morally bad. One thing you can do is convince them to believe that using physical power to establish their dominance hierarchy is morally bad. You could convince them there are ideological alternatives to physical power for establishing control authority over their resources and achieving consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of their property. <clears throat> Perhaps the population might become concerned that you could abuse your abstract power to exploit them. If that's the case, then you can convince them that imaginary logical constraints encoded into rules of law are fully sufficient at protecting them against systemic predators like you who can exploit imaginary power. Once the population has been convinced that imaginary power hierarchies encoded into rules of law are incontrovertibly better solutions than physical power, then you can simply place yourself at the top of that abstract power hierarchy by masquerading as the morally, ethically, and ideologically or theologically fit candidate for the job. If you are successful, the population will bend to your will and do your bidding for you labor for you, kill for you, and give you their most valuable resources and worship you like a god, just like a domesticated animal would. In other words, you can domesticate a human population by getting them to adopt a belief system which convinces them that it's bad to be physically powerful or physically aggressive. Once they've adopted ideologies which cause them to forfeit their real power for your imaginary power, you essentially own them. One of the major challenges associated with using imaginary power as the basis for settling disputes and managing resources is that it's imaginary. It exists for no other reason than the fact that people are physiologically capable of thinking abstractly and adopting abstract belief systems. Because of the way our prefrontal cortices effortlessly engage in bi-directional abstract thinking and symbolic reasoning. People can afford and often do live their entire lives cognitively entrapped under these population scale consensual hallucinations, where it's impossible for them to see how vulnerable they are to psychological abuse and exploitation through their belief systems. Tragically, this also makes them incapable of seeing how it how easy it would be to escape their psychological entrapment. People will legitimately believe those who wear striped headcloths or lapel pins are actually powerful and fear their divine power over generations, burden dynasties and oppressive god kings. Populations will labor for their god kings, kill for them, forfeit their resources to them, and even let their oppressors define what's right or good 
or fair. Chapter 4.5.3 The Cycle of Human History Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. G. Michael Hopf, Those Who Remain, Reference 86 Across multiple generations, entire populations of agrarian sapiens will believe that imaginary logical constraints are viable substitutes for physical power as a mechanism for imposing physical costs on attackers. They will believe they have miraculously transcended natural selection and found a moral or ethical alternative with the same capacity for survival. Moral or ethical according to whom? And then, once enough of the population has been convinced that they're secure against exploitation due to nothing more than the logical constraints encoded into rules of law, they self-domesticate. They become docile. They condemn physical confrontation and aggression. Instead of vectoring their resources to the most physically powerful, they socially exile them. They condemn them as warmongers. They place the people with real power at the bottom of their pecking order in favor of people with peaceful forms of imaginary power. The fossil record shows us what happens next. Either their own god kings exploit slaughter them or their neighboring god kings do. As illustrated in bowtie notation in figure 44, human history seems to work in cycles where societies get comfortable and complacent with their high-functioning belief systems and stop projecting physical power to increase their cost of attack. As they become increasingly more resource abundant, but increasingly less physically powerful and aggressive, their BCRAs climb. Their BCRA climbs. Not surprisingly, these societies get devoured by predators, just like any other organism or organization in natural in nature would. Meanwhile, societies which employ the grow CA first, then grow BA, second strategy survive and become the new dominant society because they have the lowest BCRA, thus the highest prosperity margin. But this new society eventually becomes comfortable and complacent, stops increasing their CA, and the cycle repeats. Here we have figure 44. When human populations become too docile or domesticated, either their territory gets physically captured or their belief system gets psychologically exploited. If the former, the population gets emergency drafted, misplaced, sent to labor camps, sent to mass, early graves, or most likely starves. If the latter, the population gets systemically exploited and oppressed at extraordinary scales through their own belief systems leaving them entrapped and enslaved with no capacity to understand what the root cause of their oppression is. During the collapse of these complex agrarian societies, maybe a few will have the intellectual humility to think twice about their decision to condemn physical power and aggression. Maybe they will stop and consider the idea that it was a mistake to adopt belief systems which require trust in untrustworthy people to function properly and recognize that their beliefs in imaginary power, combined with their condemnation of physical power, led them straight to the slaughter. Reference 87. Rather than take accountability for their decisions and question the grossly unrealistic assumptions they made when they adopted their belief systems, men will instead choose to blame their invaders or their systemic oppressors for their losses. To their graves, they will continue to LARP like they ever had the option of living in a world without predators and entropy, as if they, the, they are the only organism in the world that doesn't have an intrinsic responsibility to keep themselves physically secure against attackers. They will masquerade like peaceful alternatives to physical conflicts ever existed at any time in history except temporarily, or at any place on this planet except exclusively within their own imaginations. Such is the tragedy of domesticated sapiens and their willful ignorance of power projection tactics in modern society. Chapter 4.5.4, 4, 
understanding the social technical differences between real power and imaginary power. The 10,000 year old human fossil record shows evidence of the same pattern repeating itself over and over again, backed by an additional 5,000 years of written testimony. Bad things happen to those who forfeit their capacity and inclination to project physical power in favor of imaginary or abstract power. Good things happen to those who master their capacity and inclination to project physical power and impose severe physical costs on their attackers, whether the attacks come from inside or outside society. To recall a core concept from the previous chapter, we have highly randomized and variable data sets between many different agrarian societies who have tried many different experiments with many different resource management strategies. We can analyze these, these data ex post facto using statistical methods to find ca causally inferable relationships between physical power, physical aggression, and social prosperity. These causally inferable relationships can also be found in the animals we domesticate and slaughter on a regular basis. The proof is literally served to us on a silver platter. Yet somehow sapient populations keep allowing themselves to fall into the exact same traps over and over again. Why is that? One explanation could be that because so few people in modern agrarian society devote themselves to the task of understanding and mastering physical power projection, they don't understand it. Combining this idea with the fact that most people don't think about their own metacognition, it could be the case that people are blissfully unaware of the fact that there are very clear, very measurable differences between physical power and abstract power which explain their different emergent behavior. If that's the case, then we can explicitly call out the differences between real power and imaginary power so that people can better understand why they produce different emergent behavior. Once we understand how and why imaginary power and real power produce different emergent behavior, we can understand why abstract power hierarchies have so many dysfunctions which lead to war. Figure 45 provides a breakdown of some of the characteristics of physical power using a real example. Here, Captain Elizabeth Eastman is pictured doing a pre-flight inspection of her physical power projection technology, an A-10 Thunderbolt II Warthog. Like all physical power, Captain Eastman's power is self-evident and self-legitimizing. People can instinctively recognize and verify the presence of her physical power. It is, it's also exogenous to people's belief systems, making it invulnerable to systemic exploitation. Physical power is unsympathetic, meaning it works the same regardless of whether people believe in it or sympathize with it. More of it can't be created out of thin air, making it thermo, thermodynamically restricted. Its execution can't be reversed, making it path-dependent. Everyone is free to access and leverage Watts the same way she can, regardless of their rank, title, standing, or belief system, making it inclusive and egalitarian. Physical power is also unbounded. There's theoretically no limit on how many Watts people can use to defend themselves, particularly against her and her peers. Physical power also has a physical signature and leaves a blood trail, making it easy for people to see the threat and organize to defend against it. Table 2 provides a breakdown of these characteristics. Here's figure 45. Captain Elizabeth Eastman does a pre-flight inspection of her A-10 Thunderbolt 2. This is an illustration of real power, i.e. physical power or watts, reference 88 and 89. Here we have table 2, characteristics of Captain Eastman's real physical power. Systemic characteristics and description. First one, self-evident and self-legitimizing. People can instinctively recognize and respect their power based off its own merit, making it independently verifiable. Systemically exogenous, derived from a source that is external to people's belief system. Therefore, it's impossible to be systematic, systemically exploited. Unsympathetic, doesn't need people to believe in or sympathize 
sympathize with her power for it to function. Functions the same for different people with different belief systems or sympathies. Physically constrainable. In her operational domain of shared objective physical reality, there are a lot of ways to physically constrain her from using or scaling her power. Thermodynamically restricted. More of this power can't be created out of thin air and awarded to people. If she is to have more of it, she must be intelligent and resourceful enough to master nature. Path dependent. The execution of her power cannot be reversed, appealed, or undone. Inclusive and egalitarian. Everyone can access the same type of power she's using and countervail her with it, regardless of their rank, title, standing, or belief system. Unbounded. There is no limit to the amount of her type of power that people can use against her. Attributable. Because her power has a physical signature, i.e. blood trail, it's easy for people to see the threat of her power and organize to defend against it. Energy intensive requires a great deal of physical effort for her to exercise her power, creating a natural barrier to entry. Directly leads to injury, if kinetic. People directly get hurt when she exercises or mismanages her power, making it much easier for people to see and get upset by it, given her low margin of error, for error. These characteristics could be described as useful features which enable physical power to function nicely as a zero-trust, permissionless, and egalitarian basis for settling intraspecies disputes. Establishing control authority over intraspecies resources and achieving consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of intraspecies property in a way that is in invulnerable to systemic exploitation of people's belief systems. The downside, of course, is that projecting physical power is energy intensive and often leads to injury, if kinetic. Hence why people are often motivated to seek alternative solutions to physical power projection. If we combine all three characteristics together, we can expect a socio-technical cooperation system that uses physical power to settle disputes, manage resources, and establish peck in order to have precisely the same kind of complex emergent behavior observed in the physical power projection competitions of nature, where those who emerge as the top power projectors have survived the rigorous but objectively fair natural selection process, which separates those who are stronger more intelligent, better organized, and more resourceful from those who are demonstrably unfit for survival. In direct contrast to real physical power, we have abstract imaginary power. Figure 46 provides a breakdown of the characteristics of abstract power using another real example. Here, Chief Justice Dudley is pictured presiding over the Supreme Court of Gibraltar. Like all abstract power, Chief Justice du du Dudley's Dudley, yes. Dudley's power is imaginary. It doesn't physically exist anywhere ex except exclusively within people's collective imaginations. It's neither self-evident nor self-legitimizing, which means people can't instinctively recognize or independently verify it based off its own merit. It's also systemically and endogenous to people's belief systems, making it highly vulnerable to systemic exploitation and abuse. Chief Justice Dudley's abstract power is sympathetic. It requires people to believe in it and to be sympathetic to it, or else it doesn't function. It's also physically unconstrained. There's nothing physically limiting his imaginary power from scaling globally. The only constraints to his imaginary power are imaginary logical constraints encoded into a rule set he's not required to be sympathetic to, which are endogenous to the same belief system and therefore equally as vulnerable to systemic exploitation. His abstract power is also path independent, making it reversible. At the same time, it's thermodynamically unsound because it can be created out of thin air. It's non-inclusive and inegalitarian because not everyone can have access to the positions of high rank. There are also hard limits to the amount of imaginary power that people can use against him, making it bounded and giving him an upper hand. 
And because this power is imaginary, it has no physical signature and leaves no blood trail. This makes people less capable of detecting the threat of his power It is if it is used against them, making them less likely to be motivated to organize to countervail it. Table 3 provides a breakdown of these characteristics. Here we have figure 46. Chief Justice Anthony Dudley presides over the Supreme Court of Gibraltar. This is an illustration of imaginary power, i.e. abstract power or rank. Reference 90 and 76. Here we have Table 3, Characteristics of Chief Justice Dudley's Imaginary Abstract Power. Same breakdown. Characteristic is neither self-evident nor self-legitimizing. People can't instinctively recognize or respect his power based off its own merit, making it not independently verifiable. Syst systemically and endogenous. Because his power is internal to, belief, to people's belief system, it can't be. It can be systemically exploited, thus making it a form of psychological abuse on a population through their belief system. Characteristic is sympathetic. He needs people to believe in or sympathize with his power, or else it won't function. It also doesn't function the same for people for different people with different belief systems or sympathies. Abstract power is physically unconstrainable. In his operational domain of shared subjective abstract reality, there is no way to physically constrain him from using or scaling his power. People must attempt to use logical constraints to constrain him, but those are demonstrably insecure against systemic exploitation, and they also require people to believe in or sympathize, or sympathize with them. His power is path independent. The execution of his power can be reversed, appealed, or undone. Thermodynamically unsound. This power can be created out of thin air and awarded to people. He doesn't have to be intelligent or resourceful to master nature to have more of it. He just has to change the rules. Non-inclusive and egalitarian. Not everyone can have access to the same type of power he has without specific rank, title, standing, or belief system. Bounded. There are hard limits to the amount of his type of power that people can use against him. Non-attributable. Attributable. Because his power is no signature, i.e. blood trail, it's very hard for people to see the threat of his power, much less organized to defend against it. Non-energy intensive. Requires minimal effort to exercise his power, removing natural barriers to entry. Indirectly leads to injury. People indirectly get hurt when he exercises or mismanages his power, making it much harder for people to see and get upset by it, giving him far larger margin for error. Really something to think about. Note how the socio-technical characteristics of imaginary power are mostly flaws. Because of these flaws, we can expect cooperation systems which use abstract power to settle intraspecies disputes, establish control authority over intraspecies resources, and achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of intraspecies property to be dysfunctional and prone to systemic exploitation and abuse. Nevertheless, there are benefits to imaginary abstract power. For starters, this kind of power requires minimal energy to exercise and has practically no natural barriers to entry, making it extremely efficient and easy to adopt. It is also less directly attributable to physical injury, thus making it ostensibly more moral. In other words, because imaginary power doesn't involve physical confrontation, it's ostensibly good. However, the reader should note that the underlying argument for this thesis is that abstract power is so dysfunctional that it directly motivates people to engage in large-scale physical confrontations, i.e. wars, effectively defeating its own purpose. Now that we have explicitly called out the socio-technical differences between real and imaginary power and shown how these are physically, systemically, and ontologically different things, which should be expected to produce different complex emergent behavior, we can take some time to reflect on why people so commonly misunderstand them. 
this requires an even deeper look at sapient psychology and metacognition. Chapter 4.5.5, Understanding the Logical Flaw of Hypostatization. Okay, so I started and stopped recording this one a couple times. We're just going to tough through it, okay? Chapter 4.5.5, Understanding the Logical Flaw of Hypostatization. One of the most ubiquitous logical fallacies in modern agrarian society is, the, is a fallacy of ambiguity called hypostatization where people construe a contextually subjective and complex abstraction, idea, or concept as a universal object, reference 91 and 92. In plain terms, hypostatization is the mistake of believing something imaginary is something real. The fallacy of hypostatization is so common and ubiquitous in society that it's easy to forget it happens practically all the time. Similar to the saying about fish forgetting the presence of water, humans forget about the presence of hypostatization because they constantly think abstractly. Hypostatization is one of the most common logical fallacies, yet it's rarely discussed. Whole systems of philosophy, politics, religion, and social theories are built upon or supported by these fallacies are built upon or supported by these fallacies, reference 91. In his book, Science and the Modern World, Alfred Whitehead warns of a very similar fallacy of misplaced concreteness, where people build elaborate logical constructions of a high degree of abstraction, which cause them to regard abstract beliefs and hypothetical constructs as if they were concrete things. This is another fallacy of ambiguity called reification. Whitehead's summary of reification, of the reification fallacy as simply the accidental error of mistaking the abstract for the concrete, reference 91 and 93. The distinction between hypo hypostatization and reification comes down to the type of abstractions involved. Otherwise, their definitions are virtually identical. Reification is commonly understood as a subset of hypostatization, where the abstractions, which are fallaciously regarded as concrete things, are either theological, philosophical, or ideological. For example, abstract constructs like good and justice are generated from theology, philosophy, or ideology. People who act like good and justice are concretely real things, are guilty of reification because technically speaking, good and justice are abstract concepts or beliefs which don't concretely exist in shared objective reality. Reference 94. Both hypostatization and reification are considered to be fallacies of ambiguity because they tend to happen when people get metaphors confused with literal meaning. Reification in literature where it is ostensibly understood to be intended metaphorically, metaphorically or as a figure of speech. Reification in literature is encouraged and often considered to be good writing, so becomes very common in writing for cultural reasons. However, when hypostatization or reification occurs in logical arguments, it becomes a logical fallacy. Thus, both are regarded as fallacies of ambiguity because it can be ambiguous whether the author intended to speak metaphorically or intended to make a sincere logical argument. This ambiguity is often deliberate, such as when it is used in rhetoric. Rhetoric lies heavily, relies heavily on reification and will often use literary metaphors to present logical arguments to make them more thought-provoking and attention-capturing. Sapient neocortices crave their stories. Understanding the fallacy of hypostatization and reification are keys to understanding why people can enjoy control authority over resources without using physical power. They take an abstract form of power like rank, title, or station, and then through hypostatization, people mistake their abstract power for a real thing. Practically all belief systems use 
to manage resources depend on hypostatization or reification of abstract power, power which people think is concretely real even though it technically exists nowhere except their collective imaginations. This could be one reason why so few people talk about hypostatization because it's ambiguity. People in existent abstract power-based dominance hierarchies obviously wouldn't want their populations to think about how their abstract power isn't real. Chapter 4.5.6 Legitimizing Imaginary Power Using Real Power Force, my friends, is violence, the supreme authority from which all other authorities are derived. Starship Troopers, reference 95. Another way to motivate people to hypostatize abstract power, other than by using persuasion or rhetoric, is by using physical power to legitimize it. Rather than using theological, philosophical, and ideological arguments to convince people that one's abstract power is real, it's possible to create displays of physical power and then let your audience draw false positive correlations between two physically, systemically, and ontologically different things. To illustrate this point, consider the difference between kings and knights. We have established that a king's power is symbolic, not physically real. Yet sapiens have a clear tendency to cherish the symbolic world in their heads more than the physical one in front of their eyes. Being a modern human often means hypostatizing or re, re -ifying abstract constructs and then role-playing as if the abstractions are concretely real things. This behavior is why if you choose to disobey the king, you have a high probability of being injured by LARPers who actually wield real power, knights. Knights are people who have volunteered to subscribe to a belief system where kings have abstract power. Some of them may even believe that the king's abstract power is concretely real. Because people subscribe to these belief systems, they are willing to shape physically objective reality ex post facto to match what exists exclusively within their imaginations. So, for example, storytelling kings will claim that disobedient people, i.e. people who have not subscribed to the same belief system as them, should be physically constrained or have their rank demoted to prisoner for being unsympathetic to the orders of the king. In response, knights will use their physical power to legitimize the king's abstract power by making shared objective physical reality match their shared subjective abstract reality. This process of using physical power to legitimize abstract power is more commonly known as enforcement. The name literally means to introduce force. In other words, the name means to inject real power into a situation where only imaginary power was previously being exercised. Enforcement is not noteworthy because it shows two aforementioned use cases of physical power projection occurring simultaneously. Number one, imposing physical prohibitive cost, and number two, creating a proof of power, aka proof of real signal. The knight's power is not only projected to increase the cost of attack and lower the benefit to cost ratio of attack of undermining an abstract belief system, but it's also projected to produce a proof of real signal to motivate people to draw false positive conclusions about the realness of the king's abstract power. In the first use case, physical power is projected to impose severe physical costs on people who don't subscribe to the same belief system and therefore aren't sympathetic to or influenced by the king's abstract power. As mentioned in the previous section, imaginary power is sympathetic. It needs people to believe in it or sympathize with it or else it will not function properly. Therefore, not being sympathetic to the king's abstract power is a direct threat to the functionality of his entire abstract power hierarchy and could expose that the king doesn't actually have real power. The solution is to impose real-world physical costs on those who are unsympathetic to the king's orders. This, is not on, this not only decreases the benefit-to-cost ratio of undermining the king's order, but it also causes bystanders to hypostatize 
his imaginary power as something physically real. People are inclined to believe the king's imaginary power is real for the same reason they are inclined to believe a harmless stack of sticks is a deadly snake. Our brains produce false positive correlations between abstract thoughts, e.g. the imaginary power of the king, and sensory inputs, e.g. the physical power of the knights, because natural selection has caused our brains to take abstract imaginary things as seriously as physically real things. People are quick to hypothesize the king's imaginary power as real power because the knight's physical power projection manually generates a cross-referenceable physical sensory input to match the king's claim about having real power. In essence, enforcement leverages the same realness verification algorithm people use when they poke something or pinch themselves to generate hepatic feedback. Knights manually generate force to displace mass over time to produce a proof of power signal of realness, the exact same way the peop that people poke things or pinch themselves to produce a proof of power signal of realness. The main difference is the proof of power signal comes from a third party, much like how actual hepatic feedback systems work. And the amount of power used doesn't cause injury. The main difference is that the proof of power signal comes from a third party and the amount of power used doesn't cause injury. An illustration of this is provided in figure 47. Here we have figure 47, false positive correlation produced by the brain's realness verification algorithm. References 88, 90, 76, 89. Yeah, so it kind of looks, it's set up the same way that the sticks and the snakes were, except we have the king and the knights here. As a quick side note, while the author was writing this, the founder of the Oculus Virtual Reality System claims to have designed a hepatic feedback system for virtual reality gamers that physically harms slash kills the wearer. The idea of being that it makes the gaming experience feel more real and material consequential and materially consequential. Reference ninety six. I read that uh that article too. This is a perfect demonstration of the proof of power equals proof of real concept discussed here. A hepatic feedback system which physically kills a gamer if they die in game is, in essence, an enforcement system which, were, which works exactly the same as a knight who kills a citizen for disobeying the king. Both scenarios represent a situation where physical power is used to make something abstract feel more real since the virtual reality of a video game is, by definition, just an abstract as a king's imaginary power. Since physical power is path-dependent and self-legitimizing, a virtual reality gaming system which utilizes physical power to kill its wearer if they die in game inherits the systematic, systemic properties of the physical power it utilizes to make the game more path-dependent and legitimately hazardous. The physical power produced by a knight works exactly like a lethal hepatic feedback system for virtual reality gaming systems. It provides a synchronous cross-referenceable signal of realness to match the king's abstract power. In other words, proof of power produces a proof of real signal. At the same time, the population contributes to the illusion. At the same time, the population contributes. To the illusion. Other people subscribe to the same belief system that says the king's power is physically real, steering everyone's combined physical action to shape objective reality to match what is otherwise just an abstraction. As a result, the population is quick to lose sight of the fact that all abstract power held by all people of all ranks in all abstract power based dominance hierarchies exists within the imagination only. None of it is physically real, no matter how many people LARP like it is real, or use real-world physical power to make it look real or feel more real. The combined effect is a population scale, consensual hallucination, which can gaslight the public into believing in the divine strength of God Kings. The result of enforcement is compliance with the King's orders. People who blatantly undermine the king's rank are physically punished for not recognizing his imaginary power by obeying his orders. This
combined with routine physical shows of force, makes people quick to commit the logical fallacy of believing that King's imaginary power is something concretely real. People will sincerely believe that they are being physically compelled to behave some way merely by virtue of reading about it or watching physical power projectors. March around on a computer screen, despite never having been involved in any physical confrontation. As a side note, this is why some regimes love military parades. These parades are marketed as a show of force to foreign nations and a way to comfort a proud population about how secure they are. But in actuality, a hidden purpose of the parade is for the regime to produce a proof of power signal for their own populations to motivate them to hypostatize the regime's abstract power as real power and make them less motivated to resist the regime. Chapter 4.5.7 Illegitimizing Imaginary Power Using Real Power The world will know that free men stood against the tyrant, that few stood against many, and before this battle is over, that even a god can bleed. Leonidas, 300, reference 85. U.S. President Kennedy was among the most abstractly powerful people to have ever lived when he was assassinated in 1963. Incidentally, Kennedy's assassination occurred just five months after signing Executive Order 11110, which journalists have argued was an attempt to rein in the abstract power of the Federal Reserve. In his book, Crossfire, Jim Mars presents the argument that President Kennedy attempted to replace the purchasing power of the Federal Reserve notes, i.e. money issued and controlled by the Federal Reserve, a private institution, with silver certificates, i.e. money issued and controlled by the U.S. Department of Treasury, a public institution, with the deferred abstract power of the U.S. President. In other words, the logic encoded into Executive Order 11110 would have been stripped, would have stripped the abstract power of the Federal Reserve to make money and give it back to the U.S. government. For that reason, journalists have argued that the Federal Reserve Bank, most notably the bank's anonymous shareholders who receive interest off their notes lent to the U.S. government, would have had the largest financial motive to contribute to President Kennedy's assassination as Executive Order 11110 would have undermined their monopoly control over the U.S. monetary system. Reference 97. You really need to think about that. Back to the text. Of course, people can only speculate as to the true motive behind JFK's assassination, and there is no shortage of conspiracies related to the topic. But no matter what the true motives for JFK's assassination was, were, it very clearly dem demonstrated how physical power is both superior to and unsympathetic to abstract power. President Kennedy had far higher rank and far more abstract power than the person who took his rank and abstract power from him. But it didn't protect him because abstract power is merely imaginary power. Rank doesn't stop a speed and bullet. If, purely for the sake of illustrating a core concept of this grounded theory, we assume that people associated with the Federal Reserve Bank were indeed behind JFK's assassination because of financial motives, then JFK's assassination would represent a scenario that demonstrates how physical power both legitimizes and delegitimizes abstract power simultaneously. To fire a bullet is to project physical power, kinetically for the purpose of imposing severe physical costs on neighboring organisms. In this scenario, the bullet which delegitimized the abstract power of the U.S. president would have simultaneously legitimized the abstract power of the Federal Reserve, because four months after Kennedy's assassination, the redemption of silver certificates for silver dollars was irrevocably halted, 
implicitly restoring the Federal Reserve's monopoly control over the U.S. monetary system. As the demise of any leader at the top of any abstract power hierarchy is shown, of which there have been many examples, President Kennedy merely being the most recent one in our particular abstract power hierarchy, as the demise of any leader at the top of any abstract power hierarchy is shown, as easily as physical power can be used to legitimize abstract power, it can also be used to delegitimize abstract power. King Leonidas famously highlighted this concept in the movie 300 when he suggested that an effective way to undermine the legitimacy of God King Xerxes' hypostatized power is to make Xerxes bleed. This concept demonstrates yet another application of physical power. Physical power not only serves as proof of as a proof of real protocol, but it can also serve as a proof of not real protocol that illegitimizes people's claims to abstract power. This function alone explains why many wars are fought. In almost all cases of large-scale human versus human conflict, people try to either legitimize or delegitimize the abstract powers assigned to a given belief system. A technical name for this concept is power hypostatization. The act of believing that abstract power is concretely real power. The pitfall of power hypostatization is twofold. First, as illustrated in the previous subsection, the human tendency for power hypo <laughs> hypostatization motivates people to project physical power to convince the population to believe in their abstract power. Second, as illustrated in this subsection, power hypostatization simultaneously motivates people to project physical power to convince a, popula a population not to believe in someone's abstract power. In both cases, physical power is used to either legitimize or de- or illegitimize abstract power, resulting in a kinetically destructive war. Power hypostatization is, of course, a glaring logical flaw. The flawed reasoning is easy to point out just by asking a few simple questions. For example, if the God King's power were concretely real, then why isn't it self-evident? Why does he need an army in the first place? Remove the knights and there would be little confusion about the existence of the king's power. Without knights, it would be trivial to see that the king is, in fact, physically powerless. There would be no sensory input available to cross-reference the king's imaginary power with the knight's real power. Thus, no way for the mind to produce the false positive correlations that lead to power hypostatization in a world where the People at the top of the abstract power hier hierarchies actually had the power people claim they have. In a world where the people at the top of the abstract power uh, hierarchies actually had the power people claim they have, there would be no such thing as assassinations or revolutions or foreign invasions. An all-powerful god king wouldn't need to hire an army to fight a war for him. He would only need to snap his almighty finger. The fact that wars exist is therefore a direct byproduct of the fact that abstract power doesn't physically exist. The concept of power hypostatization highlights the metacognitive function of phenomena like enforcement and military shows of force. Metacognition, thinking about how humans think, helps us understand the primary value delivered function of enforcement and military shows of force. These are both psychological techniques designed to influence people's behavior by getting them out to getting them to either hypostatize abstract power as concretely real power or to snap out of their consensual hallucinations and recognize that abstract power and real power are not the same kind of power. Thus, they don't have the same emergent behavior. 
As anyone who's ever experienced a military show of force maneuver can attest, e.g. warning shots or low-altitude flybys of military aircraft, these are the moments where people wake up from their imaginary belief systems about power and realize that things just got real. A primary difference between what populations consider to be illegitimate and legitimate belief systems or legal policies, aka a generic set of rules versus the rule of law, is the amount of real-world physical power projected by people to enforce and secure those policies. The author could easily design a set of rules to encode his own abstract power-based dominance hierarchy and place himself at the top of it, but people are probably not going to subscribe, going to subscribe to a belief system that the author is actually powerful because the author lacks both the physical power and storytelling capacity to convince people to believe his story. As an example of this concept, the abstract powers encoded by the U.S. Constitution are backed by the U.S. military. When people of high rank try to undermine the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. military's job is to step in and remind them that the abstract power of the U.S. Constitution is backed by the real power of the U.S. military, and that real power is non-negotiable, regardless of how unsympathetic people are to it. The most recent example where this happened was following the U.S. Capitol ins insurrection during the inauguration proceedings of President-elect Biden. In an unprecedented and thinly veiled warning by the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, the American, the American public, to include the sitting Commander-in-Chief, were explicitly reminded that the armed forces of the United States remain fully committed to protecting and defending the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that, in accordance with the Constitution, President-elect Biden will be inaugurated. Reference 98. Here, the Joint Chiefs explicitly reminded the public that their job is to physically secure the abstract powers encoded by the U.S. Constitution against foreign and domestic enemies i.e. against U.S. citizens, and even the sit-in commander-in-chief if necessary. If they were to continue to organize and illegitimize the U.S. constitutional process using physical confrontation. The phenomena of power hypostatization is also why U.S. military service members do not have the same freedom of speech rights as civilians do. Most notably, the right to speak contemptuously towards public officials regardless of rank. In other words, people wielding physical power on behalf of the U.S. are not legally allowed to speak contemptuously towards people wielding abstract power on behalf of the U.S. because physical power illegitimizes abstract power and represents an existential threat to the existing abstract power hierarchy. Military service members are special in the way they wield real power. It's one thing to have a politician speak contemptuously towards other politicians, as they often do, but it's an entirely different thing to have a commander of military forces speak contemptuously towards a politician. Almost every time this happens, the officer is quickly fired. A general has a lot more physical power backing up his rank than that of other civilian officials with similar rank. Because military forces are actually powerful. It would be inappropriate for military officers to speak contemptuously towards public officials, as that represents a direct threat to the abstract power of the existing abstract power hierarchy. To see a manifestation of this concept, watch any State of the Union address and take note of the Joint Chiefs. The reader will notice that the Joint Chiefs wear poker faces and scarcely react to any of the statements made by the Commander-in-Chief. This is to avoid non-verbally signaling approval or disapproval for anything spoken by their ranking officer during the public address. Now compare the Joint Chief's reaction to those in the audience who only wield abstract power, and the reader will notice a stark difference. Congressional members constantly signal their approval or disapproval for what is said during the public address, both verbally and non-verbally. 
History has shown us many times that people with close connections to standing armies wielding real power are all clear and present danger to high-ranking members of any abstract power hierarchy. Smooth-talking generals who speak contemptuously about their government's public officials have a well-documented tendency to eventually delegitimize their abstract power-based dominance hierarchies. All one has to do is read Cicero to get a play-by-play account of what it looks like when imaginary power of senators, when the imaginary power of senators operating in a, in a republic gets a, usurped by smooth-talking generals calling themselves emperor. One way to mitigate this threat is to logically constrain the speech of military officers via laws which prohibit them from speaking contemptuously towards public officials who wield abstract power. Making it illegal for military officers to speak contemptuously towards public officials serves as a stopgap or interlocking safety mechanism that gives high-ranking people the legal justification they need to fire or incarcerate an emerging threat before they have time to organize a military insurrection. This sometimes works to nip the threat of a coup d'etat in the bud before it blossoms, but isn't always effective. Military insurrections can and still do happen. Hence why the United States of America exists in the first place. Political assassinations and military insurrections showcase how real power trumps imaginary power whenever they come head to head. Many high-ranking people have relearned this lesson the hard way. A contributing factor to this problem appears to be that high-ranking people have a tendency to start believing in their own abstract power. They self-hypostatize their imaginary power as concretely real power. They make the critical mistake of believing that abstract power is granted to them by their rank is a concretely real thing, and they lose sight of the fact that they are physically powerless to do anything without other people who believe in their imaginary power and do the real power projection for them. As history testifies, the resource control authority offered to abstract power hierarchies like monarchies only exists insofar as the ruled class, not the ruling class, is one, willing to believe the monarchy's abstract power, and two, willing to back it with their own sweat and blood. Undermine the real power projectors and the king's control authority over the population's valuable resources swiftly disappears, as it has for several monarchies throughout history. This is how new abstract power hierarchies like the U.S. are born. Americans are first and foremost insurrectionists, who used real power to delegitimize the abstract power of their oppressive king. The U.S. is proof of the concept that physical power trumps imaginary power. Chapter 4.5.8 Metcalf's Law Works Both Ways Belief in Abstract Power Can Disappear As Quickly As It Appears In addition to having their abstract power physically illegitimized, a king can also have their imaginary power suddenly vanish simply because of reverse network effects. In other words, a king can have their abstract power cancelled if they become too abusive with it. The simple explanation for this is that Metcalfe's law works both ways. Just as non-linear as the value of a belief system can grow, as the number of believers grows linearly, the value of a belief system can also fall non-linearly as its number of believers decreases. For this reason, it can be surprising how quickly the abstract power of a king or government can vanish from people's collective imagination once enough of the population realizes it is in their best interest to stop believing in it. Countless revolutions have shown very clearly that it takes far less time to dissolve an abstract belief system than it does to establish it. This this same phenomenon manifests itself in the modern age as cancel culture. A king can lose the power he spent decades building just by saying or doing one wrong thing, or doing one wrong thing to have his power broadly questioned. For this reason, rulers who seek to preserve their abstract power and control authority over resources would be wise not to forget about network effects 
or do anything to motivate mass defection. Rulers who prosper are rulers who understand they don't have real power. They just have abstract power like rank. And there are major systemic differences between these two different types of power.